Yo, what up? It's your boy, Dan Gordon. I'm here on the set of the tape with my best friends in the whole wild world. Matt McCormick, also known as Little Nicky, and Horacio Zaglimbi, also known as the Baby Communist. We're here reviewing the Nightcrawler today, Dan Gilroy's very impressive directorial debut. Before we get started, how was everyone's weekend? It was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. uh, did a lot of gardening. Spent some time in the dirt where I will end up eventually, so I'm just kind of acclimating that myself. That is just real depressing. Theme song! Welcome back to The Take. Now, uh, boys, as I said in the intro, we're reviewing Nightcrawler today, and this is the first film that all three of us have already seen before. Is it? Yeah. Is this really the first time that's happened? I'm sorry, take, are yeah. we really going to ignore the fact that he's wearing this? Yeah. <laughs> is that part of that? What, what is he wearing? I have no idea. I thought we were all doing the show in nude suits. Yeah, I mean, like, I don't have mine, like, but we already talked about that before. Where's yours? Uh, I... I I can get I can get nude. I... Should we do a well, clip before uh, he does that? Yeah, let's really quick cut to a clip. Oh, that's fantastic. Mm. Oh, that's a great piece of tape. You didn't get an interview with a couple? I have footage of them. I, I have an interview with a neighbor. She curses, but you can cut that out. How did you get inside the house? The door was open. They allowed you. Well, I heard somebody yell to come in, and when nobody was inside, I left. And the only shot of the couple is through a window. The police were shutting it down. No, I don't like it. Like what? The footage looks like he broke in. There's no close-up of the homeowners, and he's giving us their name off a piece of private correspondence. Excuse me, that's junk mail. Well, I have a problem with that. We'll knock out a killer package. This is my job. No! Your job's writing the tweet of the day and getting Deb to turn sideways during the weather forecast. We're running it. Wow, what a great clip. Uh, who was that guy that was just here just now? I have no idea. It was very handsome, though. Yeah. Very S handsome. Strike it, I don't know why he couldn't, like, stayed. Definitely brought the couch a little more together. It was a bit tight. I'm sweating more. Well, that's because you have a horrible diet of meats and cheeses. I ate a lot of vegetables yesterday, so... All right, so the official synopsis for this movie is, <laughs> When Louis Bloom, a driven man desperate for work, muscles into the world of L.A. crime journalism, he blurs the line between observer and participant to become the star of his own story. Aiding him in his effort is Nina, a TV news veteran. That was a long synopsis. That was a long synopsis. Perfect. Yeah. I'm going to give Matt McCormick 15 seconds to give his initial impressions on the movie because he just finished watching it about two minutes ago. Didn't finish watching it about two minutes. Well, this most recent time I did. Uh, I like this movie a lot. Uh, definitely has a nice, it's a nice character piece for Gyllenhaal. Uh, it's the quintessential Gyllenhaal crazy eyes. Uh, I like the soundtrack. I like the fast-paced editing. I like the tone. It's a pretty, uh, pretty solid flick through and through. I'm just so Grazio, go! Uh, I really like Nightcrawler. Uh, he's one of my favorite X-Men, and I saw Gyllenhaal was going to be on, uh, you know, going to be Nightcrawler, and I was really excited. And I saw in all the promotional pieces that he wasn't blue, so I was like, "Oh, this must be an origin story." And then it turns out I was wrong, but it was still good. Time. So the first thing I'm going to start with is uh, this film was very critical of the media and their focus on violence and fear mongering, and also consumers' demand for that type of. Uh, media, mm -hmm. uh, but the film also indulges in the same violence, so what do you think about that? You so you're about? saying it's hypocritical? Hypocritical, yes. Hmm. I would not agree that uh, it is hypocritical because I just think it's more of a, uh, I mean there's no way to tell the story without having the things like that happen, right? The rollover scene where um, the car got rolled over and he pulls the body into the shot. I feel like if it were relying gratuitously on that, we wouldn't have had the shot of Gyllenhaal getting the shot. We would have cut eventually to the shot that he was getting. Mm -hmm. And I feel like there's a lot of restraint. Yeah, the things happen, but I feel like Gilroy shows a lot of restraint in sh not showing us everything. Yeah, I don't necessarily agree with that point either. Uh, I don't think that the violence is... Uh sensationalized. I think it's fairly realistic mm -hmm. in its portrayal and it's definitely shed in a negative light. Uh, Which it should. 
Yeah, I mean, mm. you see like the, the newsroom scenes where everyone's watching the footage and they're not reacting to it, and it seems like maybe this is a little dramatized, but the fact of the matter is you watch the news and it's pretty true to what you're seeing. Absolutely. Talking about the script though, uh, I did feel at times I could feel the screenwriter's voice a little too much, like he was pushing his message a little too heavily. It was a little finger waggy, a little self-righteous. I definitely got that at the end with Nina, when she's when the dude's like, he finds the big break in the story, and any journalist would be like, yes, that's the story, but she's like, no, it's all crime. Yeah, there was definitely a message that they were trying to get through. Um, you know, it wasn't just a... Um, objective piece it was very subjective and like you said it took the it obviously the directors like media bad they show too much gore you know all we see on tv and news is violence and explosions and deaths and car crashes and stuff like that so um but it's a good message to get out there because i think it makes viewers take a actual like good look at the way that tv news is now but it's not like something like we haven't seen a million times. The message is a little trite, but I do like this movie because... You're a little trite. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I do like this movie, though, because uh, of Jake Gyllenhaal's performance. That's really what makes it unique. Yeah, I like the look of his character as well. He's very gaunt. I know he lost a lot of weight for this movie. The hair is slicked back. Yep. He looks like a, like a coyote or something on mm. the prowl. Yeah, except that man bun. <laughs> Not good man bun Jake game. Gyllenhaal can rack the man. It's all about the crazy eyes. It's, if you don't appreciate the Jake Gyllenhaal crazy eyes, just stop watching. <laughs> stop watching. Go home. Well, you probably are home. Go. I watched this movie with my girlfriend, and it's no small secret she has a crush on Gyllenhaal, but she was, even she was saying this guy, she hated him in this movie. So Yeah, I, I, I also watched it with my girlfriend the first time, and she was like, <laughs> this guy's creepy. And I was like, well, yeah. <laughs> I watched it by myself, and I thought he was creepy. So, I mean, it's pretty much, uh, you can take your hand off my shoulder. <laughs> if you want, I'll be your girlfriend for a night. Whoa. I feel like that there's something that a lot of people don't acknowledge is the disconnect that he shows from what is happening. Like, he uses the camera as a way to kind of separate himself from what's happening, and I feel like that's a big part of his callousness and how just cold he is to the world. I don't necessarily think it's coming from a place of rage and hatred, although those are there. I feel like it's just someone who's determined and disconnected. What's, yeah, what's really creepy about it is that he almost sees what he does as an art. You can see him getting satisfaction from finding the right framing and stuff. Like I read an interview with the editor that said the uh, sound cues in this movie, the soundtrack and stuff, it's all motivated from the character's brain. So like hmm. you realize like in moments where stuff horrific stuff is happening, it's there's that... Uh, the soundtrack is like a weird explosions in the sky ripoff. Yeah. <laughs> it's like triumphant music, especially at the end. Yes. The soundtrack was fantastic. Yeah. It really, I mean, without that soundtrack, it would have not felt as, you know, cerebral as it was. Because mm -hmm. it was a p pretty cerebral movie, if you think about it. Elaborate. Uh, Define uh, cerebral. Oh, God. Uh, God, I was hoping you wouldn't do that. Uh, <laughs> Oh jeez! Don't um, use big words if you can't. I know, but just because like it made you like, I don't know, it just infected your brain. That's not what cerebral means. I don't know. It just like really like, really like made you think and think about the industry and think about this person and think to yourself like, man, there's people like that that are out there. With I mean, they may not be be behind a camera. They're just probably actual serial killers. Like any other time, yeah, if no. he didn't find his uh, life as a TV news production dude finding crashes and horrific deaths, he would just be a serial killer. So, I mean, it just makes you think, you know. That's yeah. what cerebral means? I just went to Chicago and I was walking around with my camera and I heard something get hit by a car and I turned around and it was a person. And you have, you've never been in a situation where you see like uh, the chaos and the real... Did you photograph it? I did photograph it several times because I was unsatisfied with my framing. Look. And I was walking away like I just had the did most chill and all moment. No, I didn't reposition the body. There were I'm too sorry. many people around. I don't know about you, but if I saw someone getting hit or shot or whatever, I'm probably screaming. I saw a cat got run get run over when I was a kid and I screeched like a little girl, okay? But you, but you were a little kid. Uh, yeah, but it was still... I, I were, get, were you, like, 16? I was, like, 12. Okay. 
but it was still horrific, and um, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> Nightcrawler 2, <laughs> Matt McCormick. All right, well, we're going to go to commercial, but when we come back, we're going to talk a bit about the cinematography of the movie and the supporting cast. Morning, Gary. We are GetSchooled.com. You want a college education, don't you? Gary, financial aid forms. Biology homework, G. What? Picking a college, man. You and us go together like tacos and Tuesday. And I love tacos. Welcome back to The Take. <laughs> so I wanted to ask you guys, what did you think of like, the look of this movie? This is uh, Robert Elswit. This is Paul Thomas Anderson's cinematographer. Um, yeah, a lot of nighttime shots of LA. A lot of nighttime shots of LA. Normally I don't like grain, but I really liked the grain on this. Uh, it's not something a lot of people notice, but it definitely gave it a way more realistic feel. Uh, I loved the color palette. I liked how there was never like a white light. Every light on them were different colors and just had a very poppy but gritty feel to it. Yeah. Right from the intro, the intro credits, you can tell it's going to be a good looking movie. But I got to say the titles were terrible. It was like an iMovie default like You mean font. just the titles for like... Yeah, like look at how badass the, the font is on the poster. But you know? the, I mean, there was, there's literally like two titles. Why do you need... Eh. The titles have nothing to do with So the you movie. really like the titles on 10 Cloverfield Lane then? Oh yeah. That's how you do movie titles. That is. Those were good titles. These I, I kind of agree with them. They're kind of shit, but Yeah, but again, they're not necessary. I mean, like I agree, I appreciate great titles as much as the next guy. Well, probably as much as Favorite opening title guys. sequence, go. Ooh, Star Wars. I don't Lord of the Rings is cool. I'm not prepared for this stuff. You gotta <laughs> give me some kind of preparation. That opening time. crawl is specifically a new hope, because then you come down from the stars and you get your rebel cruiser coming in with that big star destroyer and you get that scale. I'm gonna go uh, lost in translation, Scarlett Johansson's Aeus. Yeah yeah. <laughs> of course. Ooh, I, forgot about that booty. <laughs> I will say the the if, if you've ever seen The Departed, I really like the montage at the beginning of The Departed while Jack Nicholson's monologuing. Well, uh, all right. Well, we're done with this topic. So, what did you guys think of? Uh, what did you guys think of the character of Rick? He was kind of pathetic, you know. But he was like, uh, he was in that situation out of desperation. I've met so many people like that, and I just wanted to punch him in the face <laughs> the whole time. Yeah. Well, he's like the only one really reacting to the horror. Exactly. That him and uh, the news producer or whatever that works uh, with Nina. Um, nobody else seems right. to care, and it's like. He was just the moral compass of the, the film. And, you know, he kind of was losing his way towards the end there where he was like, I'll take 50%. He was just fine with it. And then he obviously came back and, I don't know, he was just... Uh, he's, Did he get his comeuppance? Was that a... Uh... No, he totally was... He just... He, he didn't deserve that at all. <laughs> Jake Gyllenhaal should have been shot. He didn't deserve that whatsoever. And if... God, it, Why wasn't we're Jake on Jonah? a thing of... We're on no, a set of no, psychopaths. No, he does here. deserve Jesus it. Christ. He did. He could have walked away. He could have walked away so many times, but he stood there knowing everything that happened. Yeah. Remember, if I didn't get paid after two months, <laughs> see ya, bye. Like, I've, we've been doing this every night for two months and I'm sleeping in a garage, see ya. And he made the choice to stay where he was. Because he had nowhere else to go. He That's not the problem no. I had. The problem I had was just that he was okay letting people die if it meant he get paid. He got paid. He was not okay he with letting people die. He lost his moral sense. He just, remember when they got to the restaurant? Yeah, he was like, there's people in there. Somebody could get killed. And he was like, I'm not going out there. Yeah, that's true. And then he, he, he got kind of strong-armed into it by Lou Bloom. And then Lou Bloom sacrificed him to the TV gods or whatever. Well, I, I feel like that was just going to happen <laughs> you know, regardless. I mean, the guy was going to shoot whoever was there. Well, yeah, and uh, Lou Bloom saw that that guy was still alive and had a gun. His fun name is fun to say, Lou Bloom. But anyway, so, like, I don't know. It's just... Right up there with Travis Bickle. Travis Bickle's way Where's more Travis funny. Bickle? Uh, what the f***? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Travis Bickle. <laughs> Who's Joseph Stalin, Horacio? Oh, I know him. <laughs> Baby communist, right? Why don't you tell me about Lenny? He's one of your icons, right? <laughs> uh, well... This is awkward. How many times did you vote for Putin? Oh, wait, you didn't. <sighs> wait. That was a horrible joke. That was a terrible <laughs> joke. It was a terrible we'll joke. leave that in, though. Do you think Putin could uh, fight a bear? Of course he could. Do you think he'd he win? He could fight a bear. He couldn't win. He looks, he's a terrifying individual. He's like that big or something, and he's terrifying. 
Here's the real question, who'd win in a fight? Cameraman Brian or Camera Lady Katie? Ooh, Ooh. Cameraman Brian. Now that was if his inhibitions were, or if he was holding, not holding back at all. No, Katie's gonna stab, she's gonna stab real quick. It's gonna get real stabby, like right off the bat. Got you, girl. <laughs> all I'm saying is I feel like Brian's been stabbed once and he still can take him down. That's all I'm saying. Brian? Is that right? How many times <laughs> have you been, Cameraman Brian, how many times have you been stabbed? Once. Once. Holy <laughs> Once. I did not even know that. That was a total <laughs> so. guess. We share an office. He's never told me that, but... See, he's been stabbed. He could take uh, you we're down. We're getting a little far off track. He could take you right the <laughs> down. What do you guys think of Renee Russo? She portrayed Nina. I feel like she portrayed the the role like almost perfectly because like in that like in that uh, in this industry, the news industry, the older you get, you know, you really gotta do. You gotta be like doing backroom deals and like you know selling out for to keep your job. And unfortunately, you know, also I feel like men have it easier when they get older in this field. And she just personifies the, you know, female reporter, female anchor, female uh, in that news business getting older and not as uh, desirable in many senses. She's and kind of the same as except Rick, Except oh, yeah. she was not a reporter or an anchor. She was a news director. And her full only responsibility is making sure the ratings are tippy top. But time out. She started as an anchor and reporter, and she was probably pushed into the role of news director because she was too old looking for television. So I feel like that's something that happens. Yeah, that's a nice side commentary. Yeah. yeah, not to like make this real serious. I mean, this, it's about p him killing people and violence and stuff, but like that's kind of one of the uh, side points that I think the director was trying to point out. Did you guys notice that despite the sexual tension in the film, there's no physical contact between those two actors? On screen, at least. There's sexual tension in the film? It's, it's rapey tension. Yeah, exactly. The There's no sexual tension whatsoever. I feel like sexual tension needs to come from no, two ends. She's, in the end, she starts to come around to his side. She becomes corrupted, just like uh, Rick. She becomes corrupted because she's forced to become corrupted. Mm. I don't, I don't think you're forced to do anything. Uh, no. There's the Mexican scene in, with the restaurant. Where she's basically realizing that. But it's again, it's the message of the movie is that everyone is so career oriented, they lose their humanity. It was already gone. I think she could have said no in that Mexican restaurant. And Absolutely. And then she could have also not worked ever again because her ratings would have fallen and she, she well, was taking. Well, look what you give up. What's that? Look what you give up, though. What, your humanity, right? Yeah. Yeah, but again. I feel like if you've been in the news industry as long as she has, it's, it's a long gone. That's well, true. We're in the. News industry. I, yeah, That's why I really identified gone. with this film, you know? Like, good guys like me, we just fall behind because we're not doing Like these. you. <laughs> good guys. We do wholesome content wholesome. here on this show. <laughs> we do. We, we are the most wholesome Did you guys see his nipples earlier? In the Jake earlier? Gyllenhaals of the world. Did you see just... his nipples earlier? Can we flash back? Ratings just look right soared. there. <laughs> we got three extra views on YouTube because of that. We'll move right there. Wholesome, my. So, what are you guys gonna give this out of five whatevers? Uh, I would definitely give this a four. I mean, like, I, I hesitate to give films five, but I'll give it four. Uh, Challengers, I think that was his car. Uh, Dodge Challengers, was it a Dodge Challenger? Yeah. Four Dodge Challengers out of five. I'm gonna second that and give it four dead interns. I'm gonna give this 4.5 out of five house plants that uh, Lou Bloom love and cared for. Uh, much like say, our male fern, right? Yeah, yeah, much like our male fern. With your house plants, <laughs> I feel like that's sure. a pretty good uh, segue to. Um, Hold up, we've whoa. got a challenge this week. Whoa! So I hope you guys have movies picked out. Oh for no! For what? Oh yes, I do. For next yes. month, because whoever wins this challenge gets to choose what we review next month. All right, so step number one, take out your wallets. We're not paying you, Dan. Well, just, just go with me here. Trust me, okay? okay? Right. You got to trust me on this. He's going to have more money than me. Okay, now uh, open your wallets. My wallet's a clip, so oh, I can't. Oh, well, unclip your wallets. Oh, okay. All right, and now uh, hand me the cash. I don't think this, I'm this, doing This that. magic trick requires a little bit of cash. Hold on, hold on. We're going to do something here first. I don't want to give you. Sure. I have. I have one. 
two. I have fifty-eight dollars. I'm not fifty-nine dollars. Three. I'm not. I'm not four, paying five, six. Well, I have six dollars. Yeah. Okay. You got six. That's good. That, that's that's enough. That'll that'll work. For well, here, I'll here. also give. If $6. I don't get six dollars <laughs> back, it, it, for the trick to work, it needs. To, I need all the money. I'm not stupid, Dan. <laughs> all right, let me put it back together nicely. If I don't get this back, I know where you live. Give that to Dan. All right. Well, congrats to Razio Zaglindia. He gets to choose the movie we do next month. Oh. We're going to take a quick edit break while I mug Dan and get my <laughs> back. We're back from the edit break. Now, before we go to commercial, I'm going to give out a code for a digital download for Nightcrawler for one lucky viewer. Woo! Woo! We Woo! reward loyalty on this program. So whoever got this far. Lucky. <laughs> so, John Farms, this one's for you. E A P E Y seven A four N three six E <laughs> Commercial We taught him how to hit a baseball. How to hit a receiver. He even taught him how to hit the open man. But how much time have you spent teaching him what not to hit? We're back. Take it, Matt. Mailford. you, Dan. That's revenge. <laughs> so we're gonna take a quick myself. edit break to let uh, to let Dan uh, <laughs> peel off all this stuff. If we can get a close up, just a nice tilt up. Edit. <laughs> nice. All right. We will be right back. We're back. So now that we have our revenge. Let's do some mail for him. Yeah, man. Yeah. Which got that? Is that for you? Dan the man. This is for Snorasio. Because I'm boring. We the get king. it. The king. And some all plays. Ooh. Ooh. Ooh, three all plays. Wow. We've got a lot all of All right, people. I'm going first because we always take way too damn long to open these things. Oh, I'm sorry, Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> this one comes from Mary Keeley. My auntie shouts out. What is your desert island movie? Aunt Keeley. Given that you would have one movie and a means to watch it while you're on a desert deserted island. Hmm. That's an interesting... See... We didn't review these beforehand, <laughs> like I asked last time. <laughs> Define movie. Like, is it just one singular piece or like, an, I guess, a cinematic universe? That singular is coming movie. from Matt McCormick, a part of the Take a movie review show. He's asking, what is a movie? <laughs> well, I mean, like, define it, because we're in an era where you don't That's have something I wanted to ask you about, Matt, is several times on the show you've made the distinction between film and movie. Yes. And I'm curious what the difference is. Uh, film is, I feel like, something that says something about humanity and our place in the world while a movie you can eat popcorn with and waste an hour and a half and nothing has really changed. So like, speed, movie. Shawshank well, Redemption, film. No? So Desert Island film, go. Alien. That's a great one. I've always been a fan of Predator myself, but I would choose Guardians of the Galaxy just because it's fresh in my mind and it's fun to watch. In terms of just rewatch value, the movie I've probably watched the most in my life, it's embarrassing to admit it's Pirates of the Caribbean. Wow. So we'll and go with Pirates of the Caribbean because it's a deserted island. Yeah, yeah. very fitting. <laughs> it's, like a, it's like a how to to escape from the exactly. desert island, too. Just grow your hair out, sea turtles. We got you. Sean, the best viewer ever, Edwards, would like to know during the credits, does the moon rise or nah? Well, it does rise. Uh, if you watch it go fast through the credits, you can speed through them, and you will see the moon go up, meaning that it rises. But was there some compositing going on? There? Oh, definitely. The moon does not rise that fast. My uh, time lapse. My counter to that would be, who the f cares, Sean <laughs> But Sean, thanks for watching. It's great to see hearing from you every month or so. All right, this one is from. 
The same Not John Farms viewer from episode five wants to know, so who is it? Uh, what do you think Nightcrawler says about the concept of the American dream? Wow, Not John Farms. Nice question. I think it just means that the American view is, or the American dream is um, corrupt, and the only way to achieve the American dream for many people in the world is to corrupt yourself and to lose your humanity and to kill some people. Yeah, not exactly a new message. Like I said, it is kind of trite, but then again, uh, I'd never really considered night crawling, freelance night crawling as a profession. I wasn't familiar with the term even before watching this movie. Same. All right. I'll play. I'll play. Real quick question. You've been using this word trite. Isn't that a fish? Trite. I know. Fish. Uh -oh. I just wanted that gag in there. Some guy on Reddit asked, with loose sociopathic tendencies and business first personality, I feel like he would have been successful at his age. What took him so long? He started off as a thief. Mental illness. Yeah, I don't know. I feel like what makes uh, Lou Bloom so mad at the world is the fact that people can see through his disguise. He's very bad at hiding who he truly is. He tries to be like the good guy. Like he tries to be so personable and he knows that people see, see through it and it drives him crazy. Right, and that's what prevents Lou from blooming. Oh, wow. Crispy Bacon would like to know, why do you think Lou did not hide from the gangster even after Rick got shot? That was an interesting moment when the two of them make eye contact and there's kind of like, I don't know, it's like uh, it's two psychopaths. Yeah, yeah, it's two psychopaths There's fighting an understanding. Each other. Right. The next scene, if you would have been, you know, stayed alive, is a romantic candlelight dinner between them, <laughs> reminiscing about the people that they've murdered. I feel like uh, he didn't shoot him, or, and he didn't hide, because you could hear the police sirens coming, and who's the bigger threat, the guy with the video camera or the police with guns? So I feel like if the guy's only got two bullets left, he's going to waste them on the people with guns as opposed to the guy with the video camera. Um, yeah, there aren't a whole lot of uh, moments like that in this movie where you're confused about character motivation. It's pretty strong. All right. Our beloved viewer, Sean Edwards. Sean, how you doing? On a scale from Steve Buscemi to Crispin Glover, how creepy was Lou's character? Now, what, who's, I mean, like, what's your scale? Steve Buscemi, creepy. Crispin Glover, not creepy. This is a, this is a very bad scale. You should have started with somebody not creepy, and then... Let's say Crispin Glover is on the low end of that scale. Let's just reverse agree with the that. scale. So let's go Crispin Glover on the low end, Steve Buscemi on the high. But they're both really creepy, so how, well, I feel like they're both on, on the high edge. edge. I don't know, as creepy old? as uh, his performance was, it was also very humorous. It was almost like a, a buddy comedy with him and Rick with their back and forth. The Rays uh, exchange particularly, particularly yes. was funny. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was, he was creepy as hell. Uh, he didn't look as creepy as Steve Buscemi or Crispin Glover, unless, of course, he, you know, did the weird fake smile, but when he was himself, it wasn't really that creepy. I don't think he blinks once in the movie. Should we count that? I'm gonna give it a Jared Leto, Dallas Buyers Club level of creepy. <laughs> That's where my level of is gonna lay. All right, well, we're gonna get out of here because it's getting a little hot with these two hunky man meat men sitting by my side. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> getting a little too steamy in here. Uh, we got some housekeeping business to take care of. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, email us, Gmail. Follow us on YouTube. Uh, Horatio, what are we watching next month? We are watching the second best werewolf movie in the world called Dog Soldiers. Ooh. Any closing thoughts, Matt? What the f*** is Dog Soldiers? Bye.